Final ending of looking out, other parts down below. Put on a sundress instead. It was yellow with broad horizontal tie-dyed bands of burnt orange. It stretched as one streak went across her. Her midsection, where the second stripe extended as well, was a little thicker than usual. Tyson smiled and exclaimed, You look lovely tonight. You didn't have to bring wine. Ascending the steps, she extended the bottle towards him. Always arrive well prepared, she grinned. It had been cold, he observed. Pulling open the door, he stood back and said, Come in, please. She surveyed her surroundings. Your home is lovely. It's bigger than I thought it would be. Is it a two-bedroom? She exclaimed. Thank you. Yes, it is. Seriously, how did you score one of these homes on the lake? She said. He responded simply, I inherited it from my parents. Dinner is ready. Her grin expanded. It smells incredible. It's prime rib, so would you like some hot mustard, steak sauce, or whatever you like? He said. She inquired, how do you eat it? Oh, just. She nodded and grinned. I'll have the same. After motioning for her to sit down, Tyson loaded two plates and brought them to the table. Oh my god, this smells fantastic. Where did you learn to cook, she said. I was an only child, and both my parents worked. My mom taught me to make meals to help out. That came in handy when I was studying in England. None of the other students knew how to cook, so I made meals for my squad. Squad, she questioned, her eyebrow going up. He gave a self-conscious smile. It's just what we called our dorm. It looked like an old WWII pilot barracks, and we mathematicians liked the romantic aspect of that. He poured them some wine after opening it. As the soft roast melted in their mouths, they grinned as they took their first tastes. Would you mind if I asked you questions about your early years after you moved back? Replied Sidney. He chewed on another bite and considered that. After swallowing, he turned to face her. I may or may not answer, but you can ask. After taking a sample of the wine, they both agreed that it complemented the dinner. Sidney got going. When you returned from Europe, you discovered your best friend, Ashley Collins, had gotten married. Were you two ever romantically involved? He gave her a look. The woman merely grinned and observed him, saying, Well, it seems like we're easing our way into the sensitive stuff. He let out a sigh. No, it didn't happen. But, you wouldn't have been resistant. Tyson gazed at her. It's a moot question. There was no opportunity back then. I returned, and she was married. I met a manny and fell in love. We got married. More than twenty years passed before Ashley's marriage failed. The accident happened and took a manny. I found out in the hospital that Ashley disappeared somewhere in Europe. It's done. She got a new start. So did I. For a while, Sidney switched tack and probed him about his general interests. Filler material that could be added to an article to make it longer. Many details regarding his upbringing and the antics of a math whiz. Concerns about spending time together as Ashley grew older. While the conversation went on, they relished their dinner. At last, Sidney surveyed the room, taking in every photo. I recognize your wife in some of these photos. She was very beautiful. Tyson just nodded and carried on with his meal. The young blonde in the pictures isn't who I recognize, she said, pointing to the images of Christy. He gave them a quick glance before returning his attention to his meal. He smiled as he remembered their argument over his paying for her bike. A friend, Christy Taylor. She helped me break free from some of my reclusive ways. Another friend, Miranda Morno, had the idea to using cycling to give me the means to get around. Christy paid for the bicycle I ride to the campus. What a feisty young woman she was. He saw Sydney watching him smile, her eyes knowingly fixed on him. He confidently redirected the conversation, asking, What about you? Anyone special in your life? And saw her smile broadly. She maintained his gaze daringly, Yes, I am married. I've been married for three years. Her name is Phoebe, and she works as a nurse. He remarked, A nurse in New York City. Must be a tough job, and she nodded, relieved that he wouldn't respond in a homophobic way. It's nice to see an enlightened attitude from someone in your age group, she said. Tyson chuckled. Glad to see someone is acknowledging my actual age. She gave a snort. You have to look very closely to see signs of aging. Whatever you are doing to keep age at bay, keep it up and teach it to others. You'll be rich beyond your wildest dreams. He shrugged, finishing the last of his food with a dinner roll. I have all the money I'll need for more than the life I have left to use it. I live minimally, so I have limited expenses. He turned to the reporter. I have fresh strawberries, angel food cake, and real whipped cream for dessert. He cleared their dishes and brought the dessert ingredients to the table when she gave him a happy nod. They filled their own plates with the sweet dessert and relished it. Sidney took her topped-off wine glass to the living room couch while Tyson finished clearing the dishes. He brought his glass over to her, and they faced each other, partly twisted on the couch. Sidney smiled a little at him. You seemed like you were waiting for this next question. Devin Wilson. Tyson unconsciously gritted his teeth. She observed his jaw twitch. You're not fond of the man, she remarked softly. Tyson scoffed at her lack of subtlety. No, I don't like him. I hate him and what he did. As much as the affair he had with the man he humiliates me, I want him to be known as the rapist he is. Sidney questioned, you press charges. Tyson gave a nod. I don't expect much from the courts as all I have for proof is his confession. The man he never told me of the affair. 
a second before the train hit, unbidden. The picture of Amani's eyes flashed across his thoughts. She was now showing guilt in her eyes, but he understood that his recollections were being distorted by what he knew at the time. Even so, the abrupt recollection stiffened his body. Sidney's anxious voice pierced through the buzzing in his brain. Tyson, are you okay? He blinked wide to see her kneeling over him, her worried look on display. He could feel his muscles tense and tried to calm himself down. Yes, sorry, she asked, settling herself softly on the couch next to him. What happened? Flashback. I had a flashback to the accident. The last time I spoke with Amani, we were arguing about Ashley. Amani accused me of having feelings for her. Sydney yelled, talk about the pot calling the kettle black. With a sharp eyebrow, Tyson looked at her. She apologized in a contrite tone. Tyson nodded as he started to feel a little less nervous. He hadn't intended to reveal it, but his mouth was talking automatically. I was upset, so I confronted her about her behavior around Devon. Just before the accident, shaken by his admission, Sydney cried softly, Oh, hell, I'm so sorry. Do you have enough for your article? Would you mind if we ended the evening now? I'm a little tired, Tyson replied. It was time for him to shut up. She responded, Oh, uh, sure. Yes, I have enough. Standing, Tyson led Sydney to the door. The woman pivoted and drew Tyson into her embrace. You're a good man, Tyson. It's just my opinion, but you didn't deserve any of it, she replied. In reply, he gave her a hug. Thank you. Be safe out there. She nodded and left his house, leaving one last glimpse in his eyes. He observed until she left in her car. After locking the door, he went to the kitchen and retrieved the empty wine glasses. He got absorbed in the menial chore of cleaning the kitchen and doing the dishes. He poured himself another glass of wine when he realized there was still half of the bottle. He turned out the lights and settled into the couch to see the small wood stove's dancing flames. Sucking on the wine, he tried to keep his mind off anything but the fire. I hurt you. Her voice twisted the knife deep inside his chest, and he moaned. Yes, he was too exhausted to work through his equations tonight and ignore the delusion. That was never my intent. The blazing wood was licked by the flames. He found it entertaining to watch the fire. The voice wasn't as safe as this. Didn't matter what your intent was. You destroyed everything good. You destroyed me, too, he grumbled. No, you're better than you ever were. He sat at the other end of the couch and scowled at Amani. Enormously sad, utterly beautiful, and untouchable. He made a gesture with his body that said, I'm sorry you didn't survive the crash to cash in on this. A single tear dropped from her cheek as she averted her gaze. With a yell, Tyson jumped off the couch and stomped toward the patio doors, then out into the backyard. He marched to the beach, where he stood and gazed out over the placid waters. There was still enough of light to see even though the sun had just set. He raised his head and observed that the sky was clear of clouds. Tonight there was a silence in the air. He calmed himself by taking long breaths after allowing that serenity to enter his body. After that, he managed to reconnect with his logical thinking. Tonight, his irrational mind was creating some emotionally complex garbage. The tear was excessive. I'm sorry, he muttered, please stop repeating that. He turned to look at Amani, who was standing with her fists clenched together. She simultaneously exuded beauty and distress. He looked in her direction. Listen, I don't want to be angry with the memory of you. I love loved you her. Yes, she betrayed me, but there is nothing to be gained by anger now. All I need is for you, her, to go away. It's been seven years. Please, go. I can't. Not yet. He faced the sea once more. Damn. The lake doesn't want you. He sighed wearily, I know. I don't need to hear it again, as he noticed she had left. He was by himself. It was impossible for him to resist reacting to these hallucinations, he told himself. He questioned whether he was losing his sanity. Not, he hoped. Going through all of this suffering and loss to return to his life, only to lose his marbles now, would be an incredible experience. Update. In the month that followed Sydney's interview, Tyson became accustomed to his daily schedule and the customary year-end rituals. When the time for the final exams arrived, his students did remarkably well. Ms. Dewitt gained 22 points on her score. She was thrilled with her flawless grade and the outcome. She was spending two weeks in France celebrating her graduation, but when she got back, she planned to see Tyson for the promised reward. In an email apology, Miranda told him that she was working on her relationship with Ken and that her feelings for Tyson had made him feel a little threatened. She also said that he would have to write alone for a while. He conveyed to her his understanding. Even though he was sorry to lose a writing partner, her bond with her lover took precedence. While riding alone on the same route where he'd first met Ken and his buddies on a weekend, Tyson came across the town's official cycling club. At the foot of the slope, Tyson was overtaken by about 18 riders, most of them young men, who tried to overtake him. He charged forth, slicing through the crowd. As he swerved wide of the group, a couple managed to grab his wheel, but after he reached the front and navigated the succession of straightaways and lengthy turns, Tyson peeled them off one by one until, when he turned into the small gas station parking lot, only one rider was left with him. A young man went inside to retrieve a small bag of nuts and dry fruit since he was too tired to talk. When Tyson came back out to get more water for his bottle, the gang was just starting to arrive. 
He smiled at the tired riders who were observing him have his food. He dropped one of the young men on the first straight stretch in the valley, and he came up to him. I'm Peter Hamlin, president of this cycling club. You really caught us by surprise. None of us expected you to be that fast, and we certainly didn't expect you to maintain that pace for so long. Did you drop all of us? Looking around, Tyson pointed to the man who was sleeping behind a tree, saying, Tyson came. One of you managed to stay on my wheel. That fellow, he was quite persistent. He noticed the reddening of the man's face when he turned to face Peter again. His eyebrow went up in inquiry. The man yelled, Tyson came. The professor, you're old, as his friends turned to face him. Tyson smiled at his indignation. And, Peter angrily said, never mind. I was about to ask you to join our club. Tyson shrugged and turned to return to his bike, filling it up with spring water from the faucet. So, my skills on the bike impressed you, but now that you know how old I am, you don't want me? Ken was right. This club is lame. He got on the bike, gave a wave, and stepped on the pedals to speed out of the parking lot. He was enjoying his newfound mobility a lot. He had no intention of ever again utilizing an automobile. During the summer vacation, he wouldn't have to make the weekend clothing runs to the university, which allowed him a bit more time for personal riding. That summer, he was considering going by camping. He was idling about. As he rode by the hospital, he smiled, remembering that he had heard that Devin Wilson had left. Many of the female hospital staff members who had been harassed by the former chief surgeon repressed their fury when they learned they were accused of raping one of the facility's most revered managers. The individual was charged with additional offenses. The hospital's executives, for once, did not shield their best surgeon. He was let go and was not likely to work in a hospital again. When Tyson pulled over for ice cream, he grinned and thought back to his first ride with Miranda. He'd made his own prison, which she and Christy had hauled him out of. He hadn't looked for an escape route on his own. He'd got himself into a rut, and he probably would have stayed there had they not come to his aid. He tried his best to simply enjoy the day as he cycled home gently. He was going nowhere else. Perhaps he would light the grill for supper. If his friend hadn't been visiting friends and colleagues in Austria, he would have invited George. And it was the entire social group Tyson belonged to. One companion. That was somewhat disheartening. His neighbor Barbara was away on an infrequent visit to one of her children's residences. He thought about Christy, in New York City, living her dream. Miranda was going across the United States by car with her partner. Felicity and Leona had also left for the summer. In fact, he had no idea if they would return in the fall. Tyson was getting down on himself. After living by himself for five years, he had no trouble at all, but now he was starting to miss other people. Even in his delusions about Amani, he discovered that he genuinely missed her. It was since his meal with the journalist that she had returned to him. He hoped he could talk to Amani, not the image in his head. Even though he thought her wandering was because she wasn't happy with him, he needed to know physically. There was no evidence of the article Sidney had written. He wasn't even sure he'd read it, and he was starting to fear its eventual publication. If anything, he would ask Gail and George to review it and give it their impressions. He saw a sporty little red Fiat 500 parked on the gravel as he came to a stop at the end of his driveway and got off. Liz Dewitt was seated on his stairs. She was tapping a message on her cell phone, so she hadn't spotted him yet. Tyson experienced a brief thrill. Ms. Dewitt was the one. He felt a sharp grief come over him. He knew why she had come. His heart was telling him no. It was declining Ms. Dewitt's request for a light flirtation. If Leona and Felicity returned, it was a way of expressing no more with them. He would no longer have to spend pointless time connecting with those who would eventually move on and abandon him to deal with his regrets. His life plan had also been gone with the loss of Amani. He had to start over now, but if he was jumping from bed to bed like a lustful bumblebee, it wouldn't work. He inhaled deeply to release the tightness in his chest and then rolled his bike forward, making his way toward the stairs. She looked up, grinning, and heard the crunch of feet on gravel. She noticed the expression in his eyes and his smile dimmed. She pouted and replied, you promised. A few feet away from her, he paused. I know, I'm sorry, I just can't anymore. Her shocked eyes became wider. You can't get it up. Surprised, he blinked and laughed. When she learned of his condition, she gasped, no, no, the plumbing works. It's my heart, sorry. There's nothing medically wrong with me. It's emotional. I can't continue to have flings for physical thrill alone. Everyone forgets how old I am. I was supposed to be retiring and settling into my golden years. With my life partner, he gazed at her eyes. That's not even close to your game plan. Sadly, she shook her head. You have a fantastic life ahead of you with lots of opportunities for excitement and good times. I'm just not going to be part of it. I lost the one I was going to settle down with to enjoy these twilight years. Now, I have to start over. I'm sorry for breaking the promise. He hugged her back as she moved forward to give him a hug. I can't say I'm not disappointed, but I understand. They separated ways, and as the young woman and Tyson turned to face a woman who was standing at the driveway's entrance, observing them warily, the woman took a step towards her car and stopped suddenly. She was holding her hands in front of her, blushing. I might know someone interested in sharing those twilight years with you. Tyson had trouble breathing. 
If he did, he feared, this moment would end and the scene before him would disappear, just as Amani had done. Blonde hair bleached by the sun fell in waves beyond her shoulders. Her face, so familiar yet wiser from wind, sun, and years of experience. Her cheeks and nose had freckles, which indicated that she had spent time outside. Her skin tone verified it. The vision wore sandals on her feet in a lovely sleeveless sundress. She also had toned and tanned arms. She had maintained her physical fitness by engaging in strenuous outdoor work. Tyson forced, Ash, Ash, Ashley, oh my god, out of his constricted throat. He took a step forward, then another, till he noticed her approaching him. He ran to embrace her and held her close to his body as he felt the warmth, the solidity of her presence, the subtle scent of her flesh, and the reality of her. Tyson, it's too tight, she whimpered. He quickly got her to stand and attempted to meet her eyes, but his eyes would not concentrate. He wiped at them, but they didn't get any clearer. I'm crying, he said, sounding shocked. A warm, emotionally charged voice laughed. So am I, Ashley, you're really here. He exclaimed, hastily pulling his sweatshirt over his head and using it to dab at his tears. Ashley said, smiling, oof, you've certainly changed a lot since I last saw you. With amazement, a disappointed sound came from a second voice. When at last his vision cleared, he blinked and looked at the beauty in front of him. Even though she was older, she remained the most stunning sight his eyes had seen in a very long time. He turned to gaze at Ms. Dewitt's pout. Stephanie, let me present you to Ashley. Collins, Ashley said to clarify. He apologized by dipping his head. Ashley Collins is my closest pal. It's Stephanie Dewitt here, one of my old pupils, and a potential partner. Ashley smiled and asked. I came this close. Stephanie held up her finger and thumb with a tiny gap between them. She reached out to run her fingers down Tyson's chest and tight stomach muscles with a sigh. Food for imaginations. It was good to meet you, Ashley. She grinned at Ashley. Have fun, fortunate lady. There were no hard feelings because she stated it smiling. As Tyson and Ashley made their way to the stairs, the younger woman got into her sporty little vehicle, and Stephanie drove off with a single honk. Tyson watched her drive away, and then he looked back at Ashley with a bewildered expression. What brought you here? Ashley grinned shamefully and said, I actually followed her car here in a rental. I passed her and parked close to your house when she pulled into your driveway. Since you weren't home, I watched her from the comfort of my automobile while she sat on the steps. I sneaked out of my car and walked to the end of the shrubbery to listen when you arrived. I didn't know if you were dating someone else. No, I don't. Nobody has anyone. George Haley is still a buddy of mine, though. She was back. He gave her another glance, his body nearly tingling with anticipation. Is it time to move my car? May I ask? She inquired. Um, what? Whoa. He answered enthusiastically, if you like, but Barbara won't be back for a week. Afterwards, later, shall we head inside? Ashley questioned him, taking pleasure in his happily preoccupied smile. Obviously. My manners, where are they? Please enter, jolted Tyson. Once she was inside, he dashed down the stairs, carried his bike up, and tucked it into the spot next to the door. He had run up the stairs and unlocked the door for her. May I get you a drink of something? He inquired. Water would be lovely, she remarked, settling into the living room sofa and taking in her surroundings. It's unbelievable that you're here, Tyson exclaimed as he hurried back into the kitchen and brought her a glass of water. Right now. What perfect time. He took a seat beside her. I knew you wouldn't want to see me in the future. I can't justify what I did that evening. She shook her head sadly and suddenly admitted, I ran away to Tuscany, Italy, to stay with my aunt at her vineyard. From there, she helped me file for divorce from that guy Franklin. I shut myself off from the outside world. I felt really embarrassed. Ashley, there was nothing to forgive, Tyson said, taking her hand in his. I was unavailable, but I knew what you were going through and I loved you too. Manny was also someone I loved. I'm so sorry I wasn't there for you after she died, Ashley said, nodding. It wasn't until she discovered me at my aunt's vineyard that I realized she had. With amazement, Tyson questioned, Sydney, the journalist. Ashley gave a nod. She told me her editor sent her to find me to complete the story she was writing. She's one hell of an investigator, as the link between my family name and my aunt's family name is obscure and is only referenced in a few places in rural Italy. She filled me in on everything that happened here after I left. I had a good long cry that night. I'd failed my best friend again. Tyson raised her hand to his mouth, planting a kiss there. You never failed me because you didn't know. I missed you terribly, but I understood you needed to get away from the place that brought you such pain. Beautiful blue eyes filled with tears. I never wanted to get away from you. I thought I had to, to protect your marriage. I didn't know you were actually alone. Did you mean what you said in the driveway? Will you share my life with me? She started crying happily. Yes, oh, Tyson, yes. For the second time in their lives, his mouth met hers, and it was much better than they had dreamed. They had voluntarily gone over from friends to lovers. He held her face between his hands delicately so he could give her a long kiss. She raised her hands and buried them in his luscious locks. Ashley seemed content. She thought back to that fleeting forbidden kiss so many years ago and how she'd felt him retreat. He was hers now. There was just need, no more uncertainty. 
He took her into his bedroom, cradling her in his arms and gently placing her down on the mattress. He moved to be next to her and gave her another kiss, carefully tracing the curves and suppleness of her lips with his. This, in Tyson's opinion, was what ought to have happened after his return from Europe. He'd realized how much he missed her when he'd been there, how much she meant to him. Though his homecoming was eagerly awaited, learning that she had wed brought home just how conceited he had been. He blurted, I'm sorry. What? Ashley questioned, perplexed. I was so full of myself that I didn't think to tell you how I felt about you before I left for those universities in Europe. I loved you, but I was also so full of myself that I didn't think I had enough time. Ashley admitted, we were young and naive. Your genius scared me, so I turned to Franklin. I could manage his career and realized it was enough. You saw how that all worked out. At least you found love. I was happy for you. I could see he would never achieve much on his own, and that was safer for me. I did love her. But for her, it wasn't enough, or she wasn't physically attracted to me. I was pretty fat then. Maybe I was just my normal state of being a self-absorbed guy, and she felt neglected, Tyson admitted with guilt. If she didn't talk to you about her concerns, how could you have known and done something about it? Ashley continued. Ashley happily returned Tyson's kiss until they had to press their foreheads together to catch their breath. He said, God, I love you, Ashley. I've missed you so much. She replied, I guess I've always loved you, too. Why are men so dense? Can't see what's right in front of us, he said. Silently, you see me now. She inquired. Yes, Ashley Collins, I swear my heart will always be yours. Will you vow the same for me? With all my heart, she said, her eyes full of happy tears. Wedding me, declared Tyson. She yelled, yes, and they shared another kiss. When they retracted from their lustful kiss, they were both panting and rubbing against one another. She smiled and said, are you going to make love to me, or are we just going to kiss all night? With a smile on his face, Tyson got down on the bed and assisted Ashley in reaching hers. She pulled her sundress up over her head, and he tugged his cycle trousers down. He paused to admire her amazing body. She was in great shape because of whatever it was that she was doing on that vineyard. He was struck again by how much Christy looked like an Ashley in her twenties. She unfastened the clasp on her bra and grinned at him. Not as pretty as the young blonde in all those pictures in your living room. He grinned. That's right, she had noticed the Christy photos. Oh, you mean the woman who looks like you in your twenties? Exactly, a sulky Ashley said. Christy, too, had perfected this expression, which made Tyson giggle. Her name is Christy Taylor, and she's a good friend. We were lovers, but that's over. George Haley sent her to me for math tutoring, and we became close for a time. She was the one who got me started on escaping my prison. He gave the woman in front of him another tender glance. You are my ideal for the pinnacle of beauty. He drew her to him for another kiss before letting her reply. Gently, Tyson questioned, was that a new experience? She gave a feeble nod. She sighed and said, yes, I've never felt that before. He grinned and said, damn shame. I love doing it, so prepare yourself. Her eyes grew wide at the thought of his doing that every day. Happiness. I, I want to return the favor, but I have no energy, she grumbled. I'm also a novice, so you'll have to be patient and let me get lots of practice. Tyson smiled. I like eager students. She gave him a sly smirk. I'll be your teacher's pet. Tyson laughed, and his eyes brightened. With an innocent voice and wide blue eyes, she added, Teacher, I have this need that only you can fulfill. An emptiness that needs to be filled by a special man I've dreamed of my whole life, even when I didn't know it. Tyson was overwhelmed by it. Silently, he questioned, Am I dreaming? Don't wake me, either, she smiled. Ashley had all of Tyson when his body finally rested on hers as they swayed back and forth. This feels so right, she sighed. I love you, Ashley, Tyson murmured, meeting her eyes. She muttered to him, Tyson, I love you so much, as her body started to tremble again. Ashley arrived just ahead of Tyson, who enveloped her in his warmth. It's never felt this good before. I'm so glad we finally found each other, Ashley complained. With tears welling up in his eyes, Tyson could only nod. It was the happiest he had ever been. They rolled cautiously onto their sides, but they held each other together. Even after Tyson relaxed, he was still inside her. Neither desired for the closeness to end. That is how they slept. Ashley was nestled against Tyson as he woke up on his back in the early hours of the morning. It seemed appropriate and natural. As he turned to face the foot of the bed, Manny gave him a smile. He gave Ashley a quick glance to make sure she was asleep before turning to face Manny with hope. Now, he mutely begged. She gave a nod. Goodbye, my love. And she was gone, but it felt like it was permanent this time. For the first time in years, Tyson felt lighter. He felt as though he may drift up into space, and something that had shattered inside of him was gone. Naturally, he wouldn't, as his base was Ashley's affection. Conclusion Raging north on the Pacific Coast Highway, Devin Wilson rolled down the passenger window of his Porsche Carrera. Hearing the empty rum bottle smash against the rock face he was so close to, he threw it out the window in a fit of rage. There was a copy of the New Yorker magazine on the seat behind him. He received a copy of it from someone at his former hospital since it featured an article about that guy, Tyson Kane. Devin was infuriated by Tyson's photos as the first one had him flaunting his physique. 
He had stood in his school office, wearing only his underwear, for a picture. Little was left to the imagination in the image. Devon felt a stab of pain through the picture of Amani. She was flawless. Even Devon had a passing mention beneath it, albeit without a name. He was just another dude, an inconsequential detail in the tale. While the man's new spouse helped him deal with his PTSD, they were able to enjoy an Italian honeymoon in Tuscany. It seems that he was also regarded like a star throughout Europe. Devon felt his headache intensify and let out a defiant cry. Alcohol was not doing any good. He glanced across at his second bottle in the passenger seat. Most likely, it tumbled into the footwell. Pulling the wheel straight to go back into the lane, he felt the car slip into the shoulder. His thinking was clearer thanks to the adrenaline rush, but the headache persisted. That was also Tyson's fault. Kevin was left with continuous head pain as a result of the damage he caused to his orbital bones. Due to his inability to work, he was currently subsisting on his savings and medical insurance. Kevin was aware of his obligations. He was going to even out the spreadsheet of life. After borrowing a huge boy from his friend, he was returning to the college town to make amends. Tyson had no right to be alive while Amani was in the grave, nor did Tyson's girl deserve to live. Amani was the only one who ought to be living. If only he hadn't developed feelings for her. He choked out, why did you leave me? I'm sorry, Devon. Hazel eyes narrowed on the seat beside him, and there she was, too beautiful and too sad. Trudging in, I've missed you so much. She admitted, I know. Are you coming back to be with me? He whimpered. No, I love Tyson. Screw. I hate him. He's gonna end. And his woman. Devon, do you love me? He couldn't help but stare at the beauty occupying the seat next to him. Indeed, she was. Flawlessness. His care was making a tight right bend when it clipped the rocky ledge of the cliff face when he was doing a 120. It swung rapidly left, sending its right front fender exploding into pieces and bouncing across the lanes into oncoming cars. As the Lamborghini Huracan sped around the turn, the driver had a mere second to respond. Rather than colliding head-on, it struck Devon's car from underneath, sending it flying over the guardrail. The automobile shot through the air, hurtling for the far below waves, yet Devon felt dizzy, despite the airbags and seat straps keeping him safely in place. He noticed a manny's sorrowful gaze observing him from his right. The ocean wants you. After exiting the lake, Tyson combed his hair with his hands to remove the chilly water. Today, he had traveled over half of the way across before turning around. His greatest outcome to date. He noticed people watching him as he moved up the lawn to the patio. Of course, Barbara had one set, she was seated on her roof deck, binoculars in hand. He tolerated this as he wasn't going to alter his routine in her honor. Ashley's eyes were the other ones, and as she saw him coming, they sparkled with excitement. You look like a mighty warrior sent from Atlantis to ravish the women of the land dwellers, she said. He laughed and grabbed for the small table and chairs, taking a towel from her hand. He nodded when he said, your next book. Since they were married, she had written a lot more. In order to prevent Barbara and the neighbors to the east from seeing them, he had placed his patio equipment a bit closer to the house. Right now, the only way to see was if you were on the lake on a boat, which nobody was. It's your reward for being so diligent in your workout routine, she said as he withdrew after they had a little conversation. She watched him merely as he massaged the towel over the rest of his body. After putting on his robe, they entered the house to begin their breakfast. After collaborating to prepare their food, they sat at the breakfast bar to eat it. Since it being Saturday, they had nothing essential to take care of. Once the kitchen was cleaned up, they took turns taking showers, made love, and got ready for a relaxing day, though Tyson had planned to go for a ride in the afternoon. A knock on the front door startled the pair as they were making their way back to the living room. Ashley inquired, were you expecting company this morning? and he shook his head. Ashley went to the kitchen to check what they had to make for dinner this evening, as he made his way toward the door. Tyson opened the door and froze. He was paralyzed and unable to talk. Ashley cried out, Who is it, dear? And that appeared to shatter his paralysis. It's Christy, and... He took a step back and motioned for the girl to come in. It was touch and go, but she was trying her hardest not to cry. Ashley gasped as she joined them. The boy on Christy's hip was a little boy, maybe 18 months old. His features were mostly Tyson but he possessed his mother's beautiful blue eyes. He even wore Tyson's long, tightly coiled hair free. Tyson muttered, Is, is this why you didn't come to the wedding? A trembling Christie nodded. It was Ashley who recovered first. He's beautiful. What's his name? With relief, Christie smiled at her. Hey, Ivan, may I hold him? Inquired the elderly woman. With a nod, Christie put the boy into Ashley's joyful arms. The child returned the elder woman's smile with one that was quite lovely. Ashley gave Tyson a sly smile and remarked, Oh my, he's a charmer like his daddy, but Tyson just stood there. Perhaps you two can discuss this situation out on the patio while I entertain this little one. Ashley went in search of some noisy measuring spoons, and Tyson and Christy gave a shaky nod before leaving through the back door. After taking their seats, Tyson started talking. How do you spell it? Aiden blurted Christy. So, my father's name, Tyson murmured. Why didn't you tell me? In humiliation, Christy cast her gaze down to her lap. When I came to see you that weekend, I was going through a hard time. 
I told you about my boyfriend, but the truth was, I dropped him months earlier. I wanted to be with you, but I also wanted my career. I was making bad decisions. I stopped taking my birth control after I broke up with him, so I, I was fertile that weekend. We made love so many times, and it was so good. Then we spoke, and you helped me get my head on straight. I knew I had to concentrate on my career. The words were flying out of her mouth, so she inhaled deeply. She carried on after she had calmed down. I was going to take the day after pill, but I just couldn't. When I discovered I was pregnant, I knew I had to keep the baby. He's a piece of you I can have in my life. I couldn't love him more. The admission astounded Tyson. He asked again, why didn't you tell me? Christy gave a head shake. I didn't want you to feel like you owed me anything. You were very clear that you didn't want me. I never said I didn't want you, but let's face facts. I'm in my 60s, and you're in your 20s. You need to find a partner who will grow old with you. You're still very young, and you have so much life ahead of you. Be patient, and keep your heart open. She was nodding, but her lower lip was quivering. He felt very sorry for her. He moved his chair aside and threw up his arms to face her. She sat down on his lap right away, and as he rocked her, she started crying. They sat like that for some time until Christy finally stopped sobbing. Christy said, I always feel so much better when I'm in your arms. You will find arms out there, which will give you comfort and more. I'll always be your friend and will always be there to give you comfort. But the rest is reserved for Ashley now. They sat in silence, relishing the basic delight of holding and being held. Christy got up and retreated to her seat. Tyson questioned, my next question is, why now? Christy gave him a nervous smile and raised her chin. Do you remember when I said my company was expanding into Europe? He grinned. She paused to catch her breath. I had to refuse the position because I was carrying Aiden at the time. The position has come up again, and this time it's not only Europe. It's global. They want me, but it involves a lot of travel. I wouldn't be able to get back home for more than one week out of four. The pay is more than double what I'm making now, and the experience I'd get from this is enormous. I can't turn it down. But, you have Aiden. Yes, I can't take him with me, and I don't have a partner to watch over him. I came home to introduce him to my parents, they didn't know either. Tyson's brows lifted. You didn't tell your parents. How did it go over when you did? Daddy's not talking to me, and mom is angry she missed out on the beginning part of his life, but she's thrilled to have a grandson. Aiden charmed her as well. She exhaled. Mom says daddy just needs time. She said he'll come around, but I know he holds grudges. Tyson gave a nod. You were going to ask them to watch over him. No, I wanted to ask if you could. Aiden needs his daddy. With amazement, Tyson's eyes grew wide. I've never been a dad before. She raised her hands in surrender, saying, I'd never been a mom before, and I had to do it without support. Yes, I know that was my decision. I need help now. Tyson realized that the self-reliant young lady would find it difficult to grant her request. This isn't a decision I can make on my own. Ashley gets an equal say. Let's go inside. The little boy's happy chuckles greeted them as they entered the house again. They came into him playing with Ashley on the living room floor, and she gave them a happy smile. She raised a hand to motion for Tyson to take a seat next to her on the floor, saying, he's such a smart little man. Christy sat on the other side of him as he did. Without delay, Aiden climbed up onto Tyson's legs. Little hands grasped the boy's hair as he helped him stand. As he studied the hair, he chattered excitedly. He gave his mother a quick glance before grabbing a fistful of his own. Christy nodded at her kid, her eyes filled with delighted tears. Yes, he has the same hair as you. He's your daddy. Duh, inquired Aiden. Aiden's reply caused Christy to hiccup with surprise, and joyous tears kept streaming down her face. Yes, daddy. The thought that this perceptive little fellow was one of his kids amazed Tyson. He never imagined becoming a parent, much less one this intelligent and attractive. Perhaps he was biased, though. He turned to face Ashley. Christy has an opportunity at work she can't afford to miss. She's asking if we could watch over Aiden while she's traveling. Yes, exclaimed Ashley right away. Surprised, Tyson blinked at his wife. He turned to face Christy. It means a lot of time out of our schedules. How long would you be in this new role? She put her hands over his eyes. Two to five years, but if it's as successful as we think it might be, it could be longer. All of my free time will be spent with Aiden between trips. With a nod, Tyson turned to face Ashley. This house isn't really set up for another occupant. Ashley laughed hysterically. That's the easiest adjustment. The spare bedroom we cleared out to turn into my writing studio can easily be converted back into a bedroom. We could do it in a few hours. Where are you staying tonight? Christy said. She answered, I was going to get a hotel room in town. Ashley cried, no, you can stay here. She turned to face Tyson. Christy and I will go into town and pick up a bed and have it delivered this afternoon. Oh, what about a crib for Aiden? Christy nervously remarked, I actually have all of his stuff in my minivan, including his crib. Aiden's hands followed Tyson's surprised raised eyebrows. That hurt a little bit. Ashley's expression brightened again. Excellent. Are you sure I'm not imposing too much on you? 
I, I mean, you only recently got married, and now here I am asking you to take care of my child, replied Christy. Ashley extended her arm to grab Christy's hand across Tyson. She went to allay the younger woman's fear, seeing it on her face. I was never able to have my own children. That didn't mean I didn't want them. Now that I'm married to the man I should have been with all along, it's too late. Aiden's arrival is perfect timing. Please don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to be his mother. That's always going to be you. I just have a lot of maternal love I've never had a chance to express. Christy's eyes were full of delighted tears once more. Thank you. After exchanging hugs, the two women went to the spare bedroom to start organizing the process of turning it back into a bedroom. The women left Tyson and Aiden alone in the living room, staring at each other. With his little fist still buried in his father's hair, Tyson smiled at his son. Aiden laughed at his smile and joyfully bounced on his plump tiny legs. The strangest feeling shot through him. It was unlike anything he had ever experienced. After it was over, he realized all of a sudden that he would risk everything to keep this young man happy and protect him with his life. Taking Aiden in his arms, he gave him a dog-like sniff of his neck and ear. The boy started giggling. He gave the boy a cheek kiss. Little arms encircled his neck, and he also received a kiss on the cheek. He felt like he was being watched, so he looked over in the direction of the spare bedroom, where he spotted Christy and Ashley watching him play with his son. There was hunger on both of their faces. Tyson glanced into Ashley's eyes, cocked an eyebrow, and tipped his head slightly. Sensing the moment, she turned to look at Christy and caught the last of the younger woman's seductive gaze. Christy turned to face Ashley, who looked quite pretty in pink. Ashley took the other woman's hand and led her to the front door. Let's go look at what's in your minivan, Ashley remarked. Then they were outside and beyond Tyson's disbelieving ears. We should negotiate the terms, as you're allowing me to be so intimately involved in the upbringing of your son. He turned to face Aiden, who attempted to mimic Tyson's expression of disbelief. My first lesson to you, always leave the negotiating to the women folk. When Aiden saw Tyson's grave expression, she started to laugh. Tyson nodded and questioned, too soon for those lessons. Aiden also nodded. Tyson said, happy wife, happy life. And Aiden gave a nod. With delight, Tyson laughed. Son, I think this is the start of something truly beautiful. My comment, worst of them all is possibly Christy. Am I really the only to really dislike her? Within a span of a few hours she decides to dump her fiancé and jump into a guy old enough to be her grandfather that she just met. What do you guys think of the final ending? Comment down below, sub and bell and I will catch you in the next one.